Merry Christmas. Well, good morning. I'm so happy to see all of you here. They always say never follow children or animals. You can see why, right? Wasn't that so cute? Can we just thank the kids again and the teachers that work so hard? So amazing. <clears throat> well, I want to start up by just saying I love people. I love people. People are my favorite. Do you know who my best friend is? Whoever's standing in front of me. Amen? That's my best friend. And I love studying people. I love analyzing people. I love watching people, not in a creepy way. I love interacting with people. I do. I love, 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 love people. And I know not everyone does. I know there are those of you who are um, maybe more introverted and, and you don't just love everyone like I do. <laughs> I mean, well, actually, there's, there's two people in my life I can think of that I really didn't like. Um, and they are, no, I'm just kidding, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> They might be in here. No, not really. Nobody's in here. Um, but I really, I really love people. I wasn't always like that. I used to be pretty cynical. I used to be pretty, uh, pretty critical of people and maybe thought I was better than people. And, um, but the more that the Holy Spirit has poured his love into my heart, the more that I love people. One of my favorite things to do, so I, I got my annual physical this week, and um, one of my favorite things to do is like if I ever go to the doctor or if I go order coffee somewhere or if, you know, you have like some time with people, I always ask them to tell me a story. Like, tell me your favorite story about, you know, being a barista or tell me your craziest story um, you know, working in an ER, which does yield some crazy stories. But, you know, I love that. And, and I learned so much about a person by what they say, what their, what their favorite story is. But as much as I love people, and as much as I struggle with FOMO, which means fear of missing out, as a matter of fact, my mom said that when I was little, they would have parties downstairs, and um, she would come up in the morning and I would be sitting there with my ear up against the door because I didn't want to miss anything. I probably learned a lot more than I needed to. <laughs> Those parties were wild. But um, I, I love people so much and yet my love pales in comparison to how much God loves people. You know, there's this rumor going around that God is like this ticked off, annoyed, angry God. And if you just don't do everything right, he's just going to flick you off the face of the earth. Or he's just going to be mad at you. That is not our God. As we're going to see today, God is for people. He's for all the people. He doesn't have certain categories. Do you have like, like a certain type of person that you just really don't like? For those of you who can't stand extroverts, I apologize, because <laughs> I'm definitely an extrovert. Um, I remember one time um, I got really convicted because I realized that I was intolerant of intolerant people. How ironic is that? Like, I, I struggle with that. Um, but God loves people so much. And so today we're going to talk about kind of the current state of our, of our culture and society and um, even spirituality worldwide. We're going to talk about some, some issues, the situation. We're going to talk about the future. We're going to talk about good news. Um, but we're going to start with Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 8. And we've been on camping on this these same three verses for the last three weeks. Um, in the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields, keeping watch at night over their flock. And an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were, no doubt, terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Not for some of the people, for, say it with me, all the people. All the people. This includes every age. Don't you guys love kids? Ah, kids are the best. They're just so pure and honest. I was talking with a young couple this morning. We were saying how 
Hi, hi, kids. Um, saying how uh, children have this tendency to really humble us, don't they? Like kids just don't hold back, you know? Like they're like, are you old? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> or, you know, they'll ask you, you know, they'll tell you, you look terrible in something or whatever. You know, kids are just so pure and, but just so honest. And even kids, I want to offer you parents hope. You know, your children can come to a knowledge and come into a relationship with Jesus Christ at a very young age. They can be saved at a very young age. Um, The one thing that I don't recommend is try to force them into it and give them this false sense that they have a relationship with the Lord when they in fact don't. You know, a lot of parents, they're, they're anxious to get their kids to pray the sinner's prayer. And so they, they kind of, you know, just say, well, let's pray this together and then you'll be saved. That is not a good idea. A good idea is to wait until they realize that they're a sinner, that they need a savior and they can't save themselves. And you can, you can teach them about that and you can bring that news to them, but just don't, don't try to force them into it. Okay. That one was for free. Okay. <laughs> so it's saying it's for all the people. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 says, After this, I will pour out my spirit. This is the spirit of God on all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Notice it's both genders. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams, because old men like to sleep. <laughs> And young men will see visions. And it says, I will even pour out my spirit on the male and the female slaves in those days. So it's all races, every race, and they're not going to be segregated up in heaven. It's going to be everybody all together, all the races, all the different socioeconomic classes, Um, all of the social status, all the gender, phase of life, even the severity of the sins that they've committed. I want to just just alleviate the the notion that there there are people that are beyond saving, uh, that they're too far gone. You know, if you look in, in the book of Acts, Saul of Tarsus, he was pretty far gone. He was murdering Christians. And then God uses that guy, which is so crazy, uses that guy to write two-thirds of the New Testament in the Bible. Nobody's too far gone. So at the end today, we are gonna, we're going to be thinking of people that we love or maybe we don't love that need Jesus, people that are broken and need the Lord, and we are going to actually lift up a prayer for them at the end here. Um, it says in Acts 10, 34, Peter began to speak. Now, I truly understand that God doesn't show favoritism. It says, but in every nation, the person, now get this, please. This is the point. The person who fears him, which doesn't mean like, ah, I'm so scared of God. It means that you, you, you recognize who God is. You realize he is all powerful, almighty, sovereign, all wise, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, which just means he knows everything. He is everywhere and he is and, and omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. And he, he knows everything. He is everywhere and he's all powerful. There you go. Um, thank you. Um, he is magnificent. And that's all he's asking us is to recognize who he is, to revere him, to respect him. It doesn't mean like a, you know, like you're, like you get tweaky when he get, comes around because that's not who he is. He is a, he's a loving and kind God. And it says here, the person who fears him and who does what is right, please remember this, who does what is right, this person is acceptable to him. He sent the message to the Israelites, proclaiming the good news of peace. Remember, Jesus is the Prince of Peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Okay, so now we just finished this whole series on the book of Galatians, which talks all about how we're saved by grace. We're not saved by our works, didn't we? 
So isn't this kind of giving a contradictory message here? Because again, it says, who does what is right. It's saying to do something. So now I don't want you to be confused about this. So you are not saved by what you do. You're not saved by your works. You get saved and then you do good works. Okay? So the good works don't save you. But when you get saved, you want to do good works. You want to please your father. You want to please God, the perfect father, incidentally. Don't, don't ever insult God by comparing him to your earthly dad. No matter how good your earthly dad may have been, there's, there's no comparison. I can assure you, even though I have never met your dad, and you might think he's really amazing. But it says here, it says, he sent the message to the Israelites proclaiming good news, which is the gospel, of peace through Jesus Christ. There is a a peace that comes through knowing the Lord. And I'm going to say this, the greater your surrender to God, to the almighty God, the greater your peace. Also, the greater your surrender, the greater your joy. Remember, we talked about that last week. Even in the midst of suffering and sorrow and trials and hardships, we can still have joy. And, and I'm, I'm a bit of a PhD in this particular area. <laughs> I've had, I've had a, a long, long season of suffering, but I have discovered joy in his presence and recognizing that he is omniscient, omnipresent, and, and omnipotent. There's, a, there's an intimacy that comes, and the more you surrender to God, the more you submit to his ways. And when I say submit, I know that's the S word. Like, the more that you just offer yourself and surrender yourself to God, the more joyful you'll be, the more hope you'll have, and the more peace you'll have. I guarantee it. And we're going we're gonna to see why as we move on. So what's the situation? What's the situation in our culture today? You know, I just read in a study, 81% of the world belongs to one of the major religions of the world, whether it's Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, Mormonism, Catholicism, whatever. 81%. And, and this is done, this is, a, this is a scientific study that's done by Barna. So it's not just some schleppy, you know, organization who came out there and came up with this number. This goes so contrary to the, the narrative that has been painted that, oh, people aren't spiritual, they're naturalistic, they just want to believe in empirical evidence. People don't, people are spiritual beings and people want spiritual answers. This is a situation when you drive down the street, you know, you know, there are some who will, who do not believe in a higher power, but there's far more that call themselves agnostics. Now, nosto, gnostic, means to know. So a means apart from or without. So someone who is agnostic is what? Without knowledge or an idiot. I'm sorry, I just insulted some of you. I apologize, I apologize. Jesus never called names, well, except for the Pharisees. You know, incidentally, you know the only people that annoyed Jesus when he was on the face of the earth were the religious people? The ones who thought they were better than others because of what they did? Those were the only people that Jesus got down on. Woe, and he did call some names, okay? Woe to you, scribes, hypocrites, teachers of the law. Like he got, all, he got all down on those guys because they thought they were good because of what they had done and because they thought they were better than other people. And, and here's a situation. It says in 2 Timothy 4, 3, the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine. What is sound doctrine? Sound doctrine just means the truth. And remember, Jesus said of himself, he is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. But it's saying people don't want to believe that. And do you know why they don't want to believe that? Do you know why the name of Jesus Christ is the most loved and the most hated name on the face of the earth? Because people want their own way. People don't want to surrender to a God. They don't want to give up their agenda. 
because they want to do things their way. And, and, and it's, to me, it's so ironic that people actually think they have some control because really you don't. I had a boss one time and he used to say, well, God is good and devil is evil. And he goes, but I'm the one who determines whether or not things happen in my life. I'm the one who gets to determine that. And I was like, okay, so like if someone comes in and robs you, then that's you willing that to happen in your business. Like that's what you wanted. It, I mean, it doesn't make sense, but people don't want to surrender to, to a living God. But 81% of people believe that there is uh, some kind of a higher power. And then there are some in between and it's a little more gray, but there are very few countries where there's not like a two to 4% of the people are atheist. It's very, very rare. And, and, and yet the narrative that's being written is, oh, the church is going to die. The church, no, Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. <laughs> Jesus is not going to allow his bride to die. He's not going to allow his church to diminish. What he's going to do is he's going to prune out the dead wood is maybe okay term but he's going to prune out the ones who are not the true believers. Remember, there's going to be the people, it says, it says there's going to be the sheep, the, the ones who love him, the ones who belong to him, and then there's going to be the goats. <laughs> there's going to be the goats who hate him, and then there's going to be the people in the middle that they say they're Christians, and they're like, well, I did this, and I did this, and I did this in your name. And he's like, I literally don't know who you are. Not that God doesn't know who they are, because God is... He knows everything, but he's saying, you didn't do that for me. Either you did it to build yourself up, to feel good about yourself, or you did it to impress somebody else, but it wasn't about me. That's scary. That's really scary. It says there, it's going to come a time when people won't tolerate sound doc doctrine. They won't tolerate what's true. It says, but according to their what? it up there? According to their own desires. This is the God of self. I want what I want. It says, according to their own desires, they will multiply teachers for themselves who, because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. Uh, the NIV version says that they want to, they're going to get teachers that are going to tickle their, tickle their ears. Turn to your neighbor and tickle their ears. No, don't. No, that's, that's weird. That's so weird. <laughs> but it's saying that they, because there is this part of us that wants what we want, that is called the flesh. That is called the, the sinful nature. That's called the natural. We must be born again. We must be filled with the spirit of Jesus in order to truly live and to reign and rule with God one day in heaven. There's a, a theologian, a British theologian, and theology just is the study of God. So this is a guy who studies God for a living. That's his life. He's got a PhD in theology. And this is what N.T. Wright said. He said, 80% of what I know about God is wrong. He goes, the problem is, I don't know which 80%. <laughs> and isn't that true? I mean, if you think about this, now just... Prepare to have your mind blown. We serve an eternal God. So we are going to spend the rest of eternity discovering more and more and more about him. Right? <clears throat> Isn't that awesome? He's eternal. So we're going to be forever for the rest of eternity learning more about him. And the more that you learn about him, the better he becomes, the more incredible he comes, be becomes, and the more loving he becomes in your own mind, in your own heart, the more you feel his acceptance, the more peace you experience, the more joy, even in the midst of suffering, the closer you get to him, the more your joy, peace, hope will increase. And, and that's why, like, I know that I say this every week and I apologize for it, but it is the way to live. And I've tried the other ways. I've tried doing the other stuff, 
the world stuff and all of that, experiences and money and, you know, all this, everything the world had to offer. And I can tell you the way to life is through intimacy with our creator and our God. This is the way to life. And and you can know more and more and more about him because he revealed himself to us in this book. And I just want to say as a little aside, if, if you read the Bible and you're confused by something, don't let that stop you from reading the Bible. Because remember, God's eternal. So you're going to be learning about him for eternity. But either ask somebody who knows more than you do or you know, I don't know if I would recommend Googling it. Googling might not be a good idea. <laughs> Wikipedia, no. <laughs> but, um, but if you don't know something, just, just put a little side note and, and go back to it another time. But don't let that be the thing that stops you from reading the Bible. You know? And if I could just recommend, get to know Jesus. Get to know Jesus. You know, our next series that we're going to start after Christmas is called The Jesus Stories, New Insights into an Old Narrative. And I'm going to have some guest speakers come up. It's going to be really fun. But we are going to rediscover who Jesus was and who he is. It's going to be epic. Anyway, I'm really going off topic here. Okay, so um, what does the future hold? What is the future ultimately? So death is inevitable, yes, as are taxes. Incidentally, so someone said we should pay our taxes with a smile. So I tried that, and, they, and then I found out they wanted my money, too. <laughs> that was weird. Um, but what's going to happen after we die? <laughs> no more taxes. <laughs> well, that's one good thing. <laughs> so cute. Oh, my gosh. That's true. No more taxes. But what is going to happen? Do you, have you ever thought about that? What's going to happen after you die? What's, what, do you, what do you believe about that? Because I'm telling you, I yearn. I long. I can almost physically feel how much I long for heaven, for eternity where there's no sorrow, no sighing, no tears. It's going to be so Amazing, and I long for that. But it says in Revelation 20, verse 11, it says, now, I'll just tell you, you aren't going to hear a lot of pastors talk about this. And when I read it, you'll understand why. (laughs) Then I saw a great white throne and one seated on it. And earth and heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. Remember, it says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And it says here, it says, I I also saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before this throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The Bible, throughout the Bible, it talks about the book of life. And it says, and the dead were judged. Now get this, please hear this. According to their works, by what was written in the books. They were judged according to their works. And again, you're like, wait, haven't you been telling us for the last two months we aren't aren't saved by our works? No, you're not. But you are going to be judged according to your works. And if you're living for the God of self, or or religion, which just means something external, or to impress someone else, it's saying you're going to be judged for that. It says, then the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And here it is again. Each one was judged according to their works. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. That's scary. That is scary if you don't know Jesus. 
Because you can say that I'm just standing up here doing hellfire and brimstone or, or you know, some kind of, you know, scare tactic. This is scary if you don't know Jesus. If you know Jesus, you're good. If your name is written in the book of life, you're fine. You will be judged for your works. And so my recommendation and my encouragement, and this actually is an encouragement, is live for God. Live your life fully surrendered to God. Everything, give it all up for him, and you will be blown away by his blessings. I promise you, money back guarantee. (laughs) You will be blessed beyond your imagination. Anyone whose name is not found in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Matthew Henry, who wrote a commentary, this is, this is old school language, so it's a little laborious to, to understand, but I'll explain it. He commented on these verses in Revelation 20, and he said, God shuts not out any from that righteousness. The gospel excludes none who do not, by their belief, shut themselves out. So what this is saying is, God doesn't do this. They do it. And it says here, but those who are proud and self-willed, the God of self and proud, I'm not going to submit to God. I don't need to submit to God. That's pride. It says, those who are proud and self-willed so that they will not come into God's righteousness shall have their doom accordingly. They themselves decide it. You know, people will always ask me, well, if God's loving and if God is good, how could he send anyone to hell? I can't believe in a God who would send anyone to hell. And I always say, well, he doesn't send people to hell. They send themselves there. Besides the fact that, I mean, to sit there and go, I can't believe in a God who... That is the epitome of pride. Maybe you don't understand God. Maybe you don't know how he functions or how he operates. But just because you don't understand it doesn't mean he's not still who he says he is. And who he says he is, is he is loving and he is gracious and he's compassionate and he's kind and he's merciful and he's gracious. He's good. But if we can't understand it, we're like, I can't believe in a God who would do that. No, people send themselves to hell. It's their own self-will and their own pride. You guys okay? Some of you. (laughs) But here, this is the thing. Okay, take a breath. There's good news. Woo! Yeah? Here's the good news. It says, in Romans 10.10, it says, if you believe in your heart, and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, it says you'll be saved. It says here, this is the uh, Christian Standard Bible version. One believes with his heart, resulting in righteousness. This is the thing that it was saying earlier on about you have to do the things that are pleasing to God. That's what righteousness is, things that please God, Like, like being generous and being kind and being nice and, you know, not kicking your dog or, you know, nice things. This is, these are the things that please God. Did you know there actually, it does talk about animals in the Bible. It says that, that, the, that the righteous man takes care of the needs of his animals, right? It says, but the, the foolish man neglects them. That's so convicting for me right now because I have to put my dog down. And I don't want to. <laughs> anyway, if you believe with your heart resulting in righteousness and one confesses, with the mouth, this results in salvation. It says, for the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. Turn to your neighbor and say, she's talking to you. Okay, now turn to the person on the other side and say, you look exceptionally good today. (laughs) Do that at home too. Miss you guys, I miss the online folks. 
It's just saying, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, this isn't just saying, oh, like you just say this and it's nothing. No, this is attached to your heart. This is attached to your brain. Loving God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you say Jesus is Lord, which means Jesus is Lord over my life. Jesus is my all in all. And it's saying, and then if you believe in your heart, that he was crucified and died and was, and was buried and was raised again on the third day, it says you'll be saved. That's it. The gospel, the good news is this. We have all sinned. Every single person here has sinned. Every single person. You know, it's, it's estimated that there are 7.8 billion people on the face of the earth. And it's also estimated it's between 117 and 118 billion people have ever lived on the face of the earth. And every single sin that every single human being ever did is washed under the blood of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ, who is God himself, yeah, we can applaud the Lord. That's right. Nobody's too far gone. You might think, you know what? I'm too far gone. I've done some really bad things. Yes, you have, and so did I, and so do I. But yet, God's grace covers over us. The gospel is we've all sinned. None of us are perfect. Jesus was the only perfect human being, and he was God, fully God, fully man. We believe in one God in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ was God who became flesh and dwelt among us. He became a little tiny baby in a trough. The king of the universe became this little tiny, humble, little helpless baby. Babies are the most helpless human beings on the face of the earth. And that was the form that God Almighty, king of the universe, became. And I think it's symptomatic. It it, it just shows, it demonstrates that we too are helpless and hopeless, and we can't do anything on our own. But it does say that with God, all things are possible. And it says, I can do all things with Christ who gives me strength. But you got to be plugged into him. You can't just pray these prayers and then live your life like, you know, just to yourself and to your own selfish desires and expect God's blessing. You get God's blessing when you make him Lord over your life. Jesus is Lord, and you believe that God raised him from the dead. Jesus Christ came, lived a perfect, sinless life, and then he allowed himself to be tortured and crucified on a cross so that we could live. And all you have to do is to believe that and to confess it. And this is the next part that we're going to get to. Matthew 5, 14, it says, you are the light of the world. He's talking to you. You, and you do look exceptionally good today, by the way. You are the light of the world. It says a city situated on a hill can't be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Like that's defeating the purpose, right? It says, but rather on a lamp stand. And it gives light for all who are in the house. Now, what this is talking about, I think, I I, kind of questioned, you know, the what is who are in the house? What does that mean? I think that means those who are seeking. Those who want spirituality those who want to know the truth. And it's saying that you will be a light to them. And I just want to ask you flat out, are you a light in your neighborhood? How about where you work? How about when you walk into your local coffee shop? Do they groan and run away when you walk in? (laughs) Or do they go, yay! Yay! Let your light shine. If you name the name of Jesus, let let me ask you this too. Do your neighbors know you're a Christian? Do your coworkers? Or are you hiding your light under a bushel because you're embarrassed or you're afraid of being rejected or you're afraid of maybe losing your job or you're afraid of, of being embarrassed? Are you ashamed of the gospel? Because it says in Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. I'm not ashamed. Let your light shine. You know, you should have the reputation of being the nicest person at work, the most Christ-like person at work, 
the, the most loving person in your neighborhood, which is really sad for me because Ira and Cynthia Popper live in my neighborhood. <laughs> so if it's a competition, dude, I lose. But really, your neighbors should, should think of you as being loving. They should think that you are kind and caring and compassionate. Let your light shine. Your coworkers, you might be the only opportunity that they ever have to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You might be the only one. Let your light shine. What does that look like? It looks like laying down your agenda and opening yourself up to the Spirit of God and saying, God, how do you want to use me today in the lives of my coworkers? How do you want to bless my coworkers through me? You know, there are some good works that people do just because it makes them feel good about themselves. And it does make you feel good about yourself when you're doing what God's calling you to do. Because it says that before the foundations of the earth, he's already called us to do these good works. But he's telling us, let your light shine. And it says, no one lights a lamp, puts it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house, all those who are seeking, all those who are hungry. You might be the one who gets to introduce somebody to the king of the universe. And let me tell you, I did a lot of drugs in my former life, and there is no greater high, no greater high than leading somebody to Jesus. I promise you, it's the best feeling in the world. And the Bible says, whoever wins souls is wise. Okay, so it says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works, not the good works that save you, but the good works that you were called to do according to God's purposes, okay? That they will see your good works and they will give glory to your Father in heaven. This is the thing. You let the light shine. And, you know, and, and lights don't make noise, except my bug zapper. That makes a lot of noise. <laughs> but lights don't make noise. They just glow. And I heard a friend of mine say one time, love people so much that they start to ask you why. Is that who you are at work, in your neighborhood, when you go into a restaurant? Is that who you are? Because that's what Jesus is asking us to do because why he chose us to represent him is crazy to me because I wouldn't have chosen me because I've known me most of my life. And... But yet he does. And like my husband always used to say, God chooses the biggest loser and puts him up on the stage just so other people can have hope. So here I am. <laughs> but let your light shine. Oh, yeah, you too. <laughs> Preach. <laughs> Be a light at work. And you know what Paul the Apostle said? He goes, pray for me that I could be bold to proclaim the gospel as I ought. Now, what you need to understand is that, that culture and language are very tightly knit. And we need to, to do what's called contextualizing the gospel, which just means you understand the context. You understand the language of the person. So, for example, let's say um, you, you're talking to somebody and maybe they grew up in a cult or maybe they grew up with some false teaching. You can't come in and just start blasting them, tearing down the way that they were raised. Don't do that. You need to be kind. It says, the Bible says we should share with gentleness and with respect. This is how we need to be. But you know, I, when I traveled around, I backpacked through Europe before I became a Christian. I backpacked through Europe for nine months. And every time I'd go into a different country, I would always try to learn a little bit of their language. And then I actually um, lived in Sweden for six months and I learned how to speak fluent Swedish. And what I realized is that there's so much of the culture that's tied up in language and so we need to pray for sensitivity to contextualize the message, to bring the gospel in a way that it can be understood. My first pastor used to always say, there's a thousand ways you can communicate something, but the important thing is to decide what is the most effective way so that the other person will be able to understand and receive it. That is what contextualization is. Is no matter how, you, you know, because a lot of people say, well, I said it. It's like, well, no, but did they understand it? 
learn how to share the good news of Jesus. Just, just do it. Step out. Paul said, pray for me that I can be bold, that I can proclaim the gospel as I ought to. That's, what, that's why we're here. That's our main mission on this earth is to be a light to people who are living in darkness and hopelessness. We are to be the messengers of the Prince of Peace, the gracious God, the forgiving God who cleanses us from all unrighteousness, who forgives us from all of our sins, all 117 billion people in the world and all their sins cumulatively, Jesus took to the cross, including yours. And isn't it the greatest feeling when someone tells you they forgive you, when you ask someone for forgiveness? Some of you, this is like a foreign concept. You've never asked anybody for forgiveness in your life. (laughs) Sorry, that sounded judgmental. But isn't that the greatest feeling when you ask for forgiveness and someone goes, I forgive you? And you're like, wait, no, really? Yeah, I forgive you. Now think about every single thing you've ever done in your entire life, including this morning when you fought with your spouse on the way to church. <laughs> think about everything you've ever done. It's forgiven. And all you have to do is believe that and confess Jesus is Lord, and you will be saved. That's good news. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to strive for it. You don't have to work for it. You just have to believe it. Isn't that great news? And then, and then people are like, well, but wait a minute. So, I mean, aren't people going to take advantage of that? I mean, aren't people just going to go and do all kinds of sins? No, because if you're truly born again and you have the Holy Spirit in you, you won't be able to continue to always go down that path, at least not without being very stressed about it, having a lot of angst. Because once the Holy Spirit comes and lives and dwells with you, it, it says the Holy Spirit will be grieved when we do things that displease God. Because the Holy Spirit knows what brings us life and peace and hope and joy. So the Holy Spirit will bring conviction, which is actually a good thing, but not condemnation. Romans 8, 1 says there's no condemnation if you're in Christ Jesus. And when you stand before that great white throne judgment, they're going to open the books and your name's going to be in the book of life. And you're going to be judged according to your works. And today is the day you can turn it around and live for God and do what he's asking you to do. Lay down your life for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Populate heaven. Bring some people with you. Amen? You know, Christmas is always... um, There's always this weird thing about Christmas because as Bible-believing Christians, we believe that it's all about the birth of Jesus Christ. That the fact that he came to earth, Emmanuel, God with us, that he came to earth so that he could live that perfect sinless life and that he could go to the cross so that we could be forgiven and that he would be raised again, raised from the dead, and he would return again and come and take us. And I yearn for that. I yearn for the return of Jesus. And I'm telling you, it's starting. It's the beginning of the end is starting. Call me crazy, but I really believe that that Jesus is going to come back soon. And when that book is opened up and you're judged, you want to you have him say, good job, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You don't want him to say, I didn't know you. You don't want, you don't want to experience that. And it's up to you. You can make the choice. But at Christmas time, anybody that's ever had kids knows that you can give your kid the greatest gift in the world and they will ignore it and they will play with the box. Right? This is just, this is just natural law. That's what Christmas reminds me of. It's like we're so all about the wrapping and the box and the, everything that's surrounding Christmas, but it's all about the gift It's all about the gift of Jesus who came to earth and who wants to continue to dwell with us by his spirit. It's about the gift. It's not about the box. I mean, the box is great. The box is pretty. The box is functional. But it's not about the box. 
It's about the gift inside the box. Jesus is the gift inside that box, that Christmas box that's so beautiful and attractive. And this Christmas, focus on that. Make that truly your focus. There's good news. There's good news of great joy for all the people. That includes us, every one of us, all those in the hearing of my voice. It's for all the people. Good news, right? Let's stand. I would like you to, um, if you would, think of a person who, is, who doesn't know the Lord a person who's broken, a person who really needs joy and peace and love and forgiveness. And and what we're going to do is we're just going to kind of hold our hands up as a symbol of lifting them up to the Lord. And we're going to pray. And I want to pray for you, for a spirit of boldness, that you would be unashamed of the gospel, that you would bring the gospel to those who are hurting. You would bring hope to people who are so without hope. Amen. So think of that person and just symbolically hold their name up before the great white throne. Hold their name up before the throne of God. And Lord, uh, we, we do come before you. We thank you that you are the king of the universe, that you are sovereign, that you are omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent, Lord. You're all powerful, all knowing and everywhere. God, we thank you for who you are, and we just lift up these people to you. Can you just quietly name that person before the Lord or those people? Lord, we just we lift them up to you, and we thank you, Lord, that your desire is that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance and a knowledge of the truth. Lord, you're not slow as we understand slowness, Lord, but your desire is to save. Jesus, you came to earth to seek and to save the lost. We lift up these lost people, Lord, and we thank you for the opportunity to be able to pray for them. And we ask, God, that you would give us boldness. Now, if you could hold your arms out like this, just as a symbol that you want to receive what God has for you. Lord, we we ask that you would fill us baptize us to overflowing, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Lord, let us be lights that shine in the darkness. Lord, the darkness cannot overcome the light. Father, fill us. Jesus, fill us with your Spirit. Let us be a testimony and a light of your grace and forgiveness and kindness and compassion and mercy. Lord, we just thank you for who you are. And now if everybody, if you just would keep your eyes closed, if there is anybody here and and you've never heard what I'm talking about or you've heard it and you just haven't been sure, if you are not born again by the Spirit of God or if you have not accepted Christ into your life or received him in your heart or received the forgiveness that he offers on the cross, I just, just between you and God, would you just slip your hand up? As a symbol, Lord, I want to be saved. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your grace. Oh, God, thank you that you have come to seek and save the lost and to put us on a path that leads to life, a path that leads to joy and fulfillment and meaning and purpose. And we just We thank you and we praise you and we are so grateful that you came to earth on that first Christmas morning, that you came to earth for us so that you could dwell with us, Emmanuel, God with us. We love you and we bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I just want to say one more prayer over you. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you and protect you. The Lord make his face shine on you. The Lord be gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And everyone said, amen. Amen. I love you guys. I love people. People are my favorite. Go love some people right now. Amen. See you next week. I mean, I won't see you next week. We don't have church next week. 
Bye for those of you who are online. Love you.